Um, we're going to move on now, and next we will hear from Dr. Patrick Carter. Dr. Carter is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine in the School of Medicine and also in Health Behavior and Health Education in the School of Public Health, both of which are at the University of Michigan. He's also the Director of the CDC-funded University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center and part of the leadership team for the NICHD-funded Firearm Safety Among Children's and Teens, or FACS, Consortium. Dr. Carter's research is within the field of firearm injury prevention, specifically the development, testing, and implementation of emergency department-based interventions to decrease firearm violence, youth violence, and associated risk behaviors, such as substance use, among high-risk urban youth populations. Please remember to type all questions in the Q&A box, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Carter. Thank you. I'm going to be talking today about firearm violence among youth in urban communities and some of the prevention programs that we have developed for emergency department settings. I don't have any significant conflicts of interest or financial disclosures other than funding. And I do want to, before I start talking about our work, acknowledge that um, the data I'm going to be presenting and the work I'm going to be presenting is part of a much larger team of researchers and collaborators, and I want to acknowledge their contributions to our research work. By way of background, um, as I think most people are probably familiar with, uh, firearm violence uh, uh, impacts about 40,000 people every year who die from firearm-related injuries. Among youth and emerging adult populations, specifically 10 to 24-year-olds, firearms are the leading cause of death, with about 60% of those deaths uh, resulting from interpersonal violence. So this represents about one in every four deaths that occur among youth and emerging adult populations. And these uh, uh, firearm deaths uh, disproportionately impact African-American youth, where rates of fi uh, firearm fatalities are about eight times higher than they are for white youth. So this represents a significant public health problem requiring attention. I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about some of the data um, from our emergency department studies. And really our research questions focus around um, two main concepts. The first being, you know, what do we understand about um, these populations and who is most at risk for being involved in fire and violence or suffering the consequences of fire and violence? And the second part of that equation is, what can we do in an emergency department setting to intervene and decrease or reduce um, both uh, violence involvement and violence consequences such as a violent injury, as well as uh, fire and related uh, outcomes? Some of the initial data I'll talk about here comes from our Flint Youth Injury Study. And this was a longitudinal cohort study that was done over uh, 24 months um, where we recruited youth from the emergency department who were present for an assault injury as well as a comparison cohort of non-assault injured youth. And we examined uh, violent injury outcomes as well as fire and violence outcomes and a whole array of other um, health services and uh, um, uh, social data. The main thing I want to emphasize here is that this is a high risk population. About 20% of the youth who come in uh, for a violent injury are, are coming in because of a firearm related injury. And they have high rates at the baseline assessment of alcohol and substance use disorders. They have high rates of retaliatory attitudes or behaviors favoring or retaliation. And they have high rates of um, having firearms. And the outcomes among this population um, are worse than those of the comparison cohorts. So when we look specifically at those youth who come in with an assault injury, over a third come back within the next two years for repeat violent injury. Almost two thirds have some involvement in a firearm violent event. Uh, and about half end up uh, being engaged within the criminal justice system. And the factors that drive some of those differences are higher severity alcohol and drug use, underlying mental health issues such as PTSD, attitudes that favor retaliation, and regular carriage uh, of a firearm. Yeah. This type of data also gives us some indication of the types of things that we can do to impact these negative trajectories. So when we look over time at this panel data and we look at what factors at each wave of the data increase the risk of carrying a firearm, we see that those youth who had more negative peer affiliations than they do on average, those who experience more victimization, those who are exposed to greater amounts of community violence or those that have higher rates of retaliatory attitudes were more likely to carry a firearm at that wave. Similarly, those who had more positive or pro-social peer affiliations than their average actually had decreased rates of firearm carriage, indicating that this may be a part of 
um, a type of intervention that we uh, would want to incorporate is enhancing pro-social factors and, and pro-social relationships with youth. From some initial pilot data, we can look at what happens at the daily level with firearm carriage and, and uh, relationships between firearm carriage and other factors. And this is pilot data from uh, a project funded by the, Interact called, uh, by the NIH called Interact, where we uh, put a, a smartphone app on kids' phone and followed them prospectively for 30 days, finding that youth did not carry firearms uh, every day, but actually carried somewhat intermittently over the time frame. We're also able to assess with this type of data what are the underlying factors that uh, motivate youth to both carry firearms and not carry firearms. And the majority of the time youth tell us that they're carrying firearms for self-protection. So, um, you know, they, they may be exposed to high rates of community violence and feel that they need to protect themselves by carrying a firearm, however, end up using it in risky ways. Uh, and similarly, we can look at what motivates youth to not carry firearms. And on the majority of days, youth tell us that it's because they perceived that it was a low risk day that they weren't going to be in a location that required them to carry a firearm. We can also look at factors that occur on the same day to help us decide what are some of the other factors that may be causing youth to escalate behaviors into risky firearm behaviors. And so we, uh, as part of this study, looked at what were some of the factors that that influence the likelihood of both carriage of a firearm as well as the likelihood of getting into violence or fighting behaviors. And from this data, the sort of meta message of this is that youth are more likely to carry firearms when they are perceiving themselves to be in high risk locations or on at times when they are engaging in higher risk behaviors, such as the weekend. There didn't seem to be a relationship specifically with carriage and cognitive factors such as anger, stress, anxiety, um, uh, or substance use uh, with that and carriage. Uh, however, we did notice that there was those associations occurring at the daily level with fighting or violence behaviors. Anger, uh, days where youth were uh, more likely to be angry or perceiving that they had higher stress or anxiety symptoms, they were more likely to engage in fighting behaviors. Similarly, in the presence of alcohol, drug use, prescription drug use, they were more likely to engage in fighting behaviors. And so taken together, it's not the act of actually just carrying the firearm, but it seems to be the act of carrying the firearm at a time when these other sort of factors are in play, such as substance use, anger, and uh, stress and anxiety levels, and the presence of a risky location that escalate uh, what may be just a routine carriage of a firearm for protection to actually engaging in more risky firearm behaviors. Again, this gives us some indication of the types of intervention targets that we would want to um, engage within a behavioral intervention to address uh, risky fire behaviors and violence behaviors. And I'm going to shift gears for a minute and talk a little bit about uh, some of the prevention uh, work that we're doing and the design of some behavioral interventions uh, based on this pilot data that I sort of already talked about um, uh, for intervening with both risky fire behaviors and for uh, violent injury among youth. One of the first questions I often get from folks is, you know, why do violence prevention in the emergency department? And one of the key answers that I uh, often give is that the emergency department is a key location in which to access youth who may be at risk before they are actually engaged in the criminal justice system. And the emergency department and an emergency department visit provides really a teachable moment in which you may be able to change the trajectory of violence involvement. And these youth who are at increased risk may be missed in school-based programs or primary care doctor's offices. Um, uh, and so the emergency department may be the one place where they actually intervene with a public health system that we can intervene before they end up in the criminal justice system. So it really is an opportunity for primary and secondary prevention efforts. And I'm going to talk about two studies that we have ongoing currently, uh, one that's focused in the area of primary prevention and one that's focused more in the area of secondary prevention. And uh, just so that we're all sort of oriented to how we're thinking about those terms, um, I think about primary prevention as preventing that violent injury visit in the emergency department and secondary prevention as, as thinking about how we can prevent a second violent injury visit after the youth is there for violent injury. And so I'll talk about two studies that are focused kind of in these different areas. And the first one that I'll talk about is in more of the primary prevention area. <clears throat> 
So a lot of the work I'm going to talk about builds from our uh, teams uh, and mentors prior work in uh, primary prevention, uh, specifically the Safer Teens Project, which is actually considered a CDC best practice for youth violence prevention. Uh, and it was a uh, intervention that was developed initially with NIH funds and has been translated into emergency department settings. It's a brief intervention that combines motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy to address uh, violence uh, prevention amongst um, uh, you two have a history of fighting, and it involves a 30-minute uh, therapist uh, conversation in the emergency department. Um, so what we've done now and what we're testing now is we've built on this initial Safer Teens intervention within, with an intervention that's specifically focused for um, uh, youth who engage in risky firearm behaviors. And so we took the initial brief single session intervention of Safer Teens and we've built out a multi-session intervention that combines, again, motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy and layers on strengths-based care management to appropriately direct youth to necessary resources. And then to augment the effects of this therapist intervention, which is delivered over multiple sessions, we also have de developed a smartphone app that we are loading on kids' phones phone that provides interventional content in between the therapist sessions. And here you can see some schematic pictures of, of um, what the app looks like. So the app does daily assessments via a survey, which you can see the two panels on the left do that. And it's very much based in a strengths-based or goal-based approach. And, uh, and so we do a lot of messaging that is around uh, their strengths and the goals that they identify in their initial sessions with the therapist. And so you can see that that's in intimately built into the app. Youth also receive messaging that's tailored by their responses on the survey around substance use and stress and anxiety and anger and fire and carriage that's tailored by their motivations. They receive a motivational interviewing message and a cognitive behavioral therapy message on a daily basis. And that is meant to uh, uh, be interspersed with these therapy sessions that they're getting. And here in this schematic, you can see some examples of a motivational interviewing message and a cognitive behavioral therapy message. We've also built out a number of infographics that are delivered concurrently uh, with the uh, messaging. I'll also note that we, um, based on that pilot data that showed that, that when youth are in riskier locations, there's some concerns about um, uh, uh, higher risk firearm behaviors and violence behaviors, we've built out a GPS component where they identify places that they think are high risk or where they've engaged in high risk behaviors before and can get just in time messaging via the app uh, to help try and prevent those behaviors or increase pro social support at those times that they need that the most. And then the app also has built in resources for the community. There's a number of engagement metrics built into the app too, including daily memes and, uh, and other messaging in order to enhance engagement with the app component. I'll finish up quickly here by talking about um, uh, another intervention that we're doing that's really focused around secondary prevention of youth who come in with violent injuries and trying to prevent that recurrent violent injury. And this project is called Project Synergy. And similarly to the uh, prior Interact project that I talked about, it combines this motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy and care management, but now tests two different approaches. One approach that is a straight multi-session therapist delivered intervention, and another approach that is variable in nature depending on how the kid does over time that combines both the therapist approach with automated messaging via uh, uh, electronic health coach. And we're testing both the both uh, approaches with this intervention, as well as the adaptability of the uh, artificial intelligence um, uh, arm to adapt the level of intervention over time that the kid gets and to see whether or not that can have the same outcomes as the group that receives a straightforward therapist intervention. And I won't go into the specifics of this slide, but, um, but this uh, artificial intelligence algorithm is tailored by daily surveys and decides on a biweekly basis the different type or level of intensity intervention that the, that the youth receives during their emergency department uh, intervention. And with that, I'll finish up and take any questions that you have about the work that I'm presenting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter, for this for this interesting work on um, firearm violence prevention programs among youth. Let's see, we have some questions that are coming in. The first one is, do you have a sense of whether people will interact with and this app and actually like answer these daily questions um, on this app? Can you speak to that? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, and I don't want to totally uh, step on a presentation that's coming later in the morning, but um, but we do have some data from a, sort of an initial pilot of uh, putting this type of app on kids' phone that they do engage with the app. They will answer daily survey questions mm -hmm. about behaviors and they feel very comfortable with that modality. Um, and uh, one of our um, team members, Jennifer Connolly, is actually going to be presenting this in the poster session that will be following these live chat talks. But the short answer to that is yes, kids do engage with this and we think it's a, a, a good platform, um, especially with adolescents in today's technology driven world. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And we, it sounds like people who are interested in more information should check out that poster session later, which I think is between 12 and 1. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. What about, what about next steps with this research? So it sounds like you've, you've developed these programs, but um, you're sort of maybe in the middle of delivering them or, or where are you at currently and where are you going? That's a great question. So, you know, I think a fundamental to this research, and you've heard researchers all morning talk about this, Dr. Caldwell talked about this with her work that she presented on father and sons, is getting feedback once you sort of pilot this, these types of programs. And so right now we're in a phase where we're piloting the full, um, the full uh, intervention, which includes both the therapist delivered pieces uh, for Interact as well as the app pieces. Um, and we're getting feedback from the kids on, on that. And, and the next step is to take that to full scale and to uh, do a full-scale efficacy trial that looks at the effectiveness of this in reducing risky firearm behaviors among youth that we enroll from the emergency department setting. So, uh, so there's more to come. Obviously, this is sort of mm -hmm. beginning of this work, um, but I think uh, what we've seen so far suggests that it's very promising, and uh, and we're going to keep moving it along the spectrum of uh, translational research. Thank you. Additional comments that we're getting coming in: "Quote, amazing work." Um, how did you handle objections to loading the app on smartphones, either because they weren't available or they weren't interested? And what about people who, so fall, who sort of fall off, who stop participating? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, we haven't really had anybody object to having the app put on their phone. We have run into some technical um, uh, glitches in terms of, um, you know, making sure somebody, if they're in the emergency department and they're there for a, a medical visit, their phone might not be charged, so they might not have enough bandwidth or space on their phone. And so we've had to navigate some of those more technological challenges of having chargers available for the kids in the, in the ED and, uh, and helping them to figure out how to, how to have more space on their phone. Um, in terms of, um, uh, some of the elements of the app, they are able to be turned on and off. So for example, I spoke a little bit about the GPS uh, locator uh, portion where they would get messages. That is a component of the app that if uh, a kid tells us they don't want to have their location recorded that we can turn off. So it's really based in the sort of motivational interviewing framework where kids have the autonomy to decide what elements of the intervention they would most uh, be comfortable engaging with. And so I think that's a really important part of this type of intervention is making sure that those, those elements are, are factored in. There's a variety of other questions coming in. I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, is the app available uh, outside of your research study? And could it be available for those with no health insurance? That's a great question. So, uh, so right now it's it's still very much squarely in the research realm. So we're still figuring out whether this is an effective modality to deliver this type of intervention, and whether this is something kids will will engage with and do as part of their as part of a research study. I mean, I I think if we look toward the future, ideally we would be able to move this from the research space into the clinical space if we find that it's effective. And so I think we have that's a first major step is to see whether or not this type of intervention that's you know therapist driven but aided by technology is um, is able to be uh, effective at decreasing risky firearm behaviors I think the second part of the question is around how do we pay for this type of intervention and I think you know ideally um, if we're able to show that it's effective we have other behavioral interventions that we do in healthcare that are reimbursed through insurance codes um, and it would be ideal that this type of intervention if we've shown that it is effective we could move into that same realm Realm where we uh, where we have uh, public health payers as well as private payers able to pay for this type of preventative intervention to be done to prevent kids from ending up in the emergency department uh, with firearm injuries or other types of violent injuries or substance use consequences. So I think that's a long-term goal, but certainly one that I think is feasible based on. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Thank you very much. It's really exciting to think about how mobile health can be applied to firearm violence prevention with youth. Really, really in interesting. Thank you, Dr. Carter.